Now, over the last year and a few months as I've been pastor here, I've talked several times about my time with the Society of St. John the Evangelist. How during my years in seminary, I would go week after week to their monastery house there in Durham, North Carolina, for Holy Communion and a time for quiet prayer and fellowship. About how I met Eldridge Pendleton, and he became a very close friend of mine during those years. And how I met the other brothers of the society, and how I felt God's call to test my vocation as a monk in their society, and went to Cambridge, Massachusetts, for nine months as a novice there. From the brothers, I learned a great deal about prayer. Oh, as a child, I'd learned a lot about prayer from my family, from my mother and from my dad. My parents taught me to kneel at the edge of my bed every night and to fold my hands and to pray to pray for my brother, who was often hard to pray for, to pray for mommy and daddy and my grandparents, to, to pray for my teachers, to pray for my school and my classmates, and to pray for our family and my church, and finally, last of all, to pray for myself. My mom and dad taught me prayer by precept and example. They taught me to pray. They led me in prayer. I learned how to pray from them. They, they, they taught me about how prayer is not just a time to ask God for things. Oh, it's certainly that. But it's a time to thank God for what we have already received and for what we are about to receive. But even more amazingly, prayer is a time, they taught me that prayer is a time to actually receive what God has for us. I can remember kneeling at church at Walnut Hill United Methodist Church as a little child. And as much as I loved the Jesus bread and the Jesus juice, it was that quiet time at the altar rail praying that I remember so very well. There were those moments in my childhood those moments of closeness with God that changed my life forever, for eternity. Prayer should be, prayer can be, prayer must be the most powerful time in the spiritual life of a Christian. And because of that, there are, of course, many challenges to prayer. There's sleepiness. How many times have I been praying and found myself nodding off? I heard an amen. It's true. I'll be praying for someone or a whole group of someones. I'll be in the midst of prayer. I'll have this list of things I need to pray for, and I'm praying, and it's quiet, and I'm comfortable, and guess what? <sighs> I start to fall asleep. Sleepiness is a challenge to prayer. Forgetfulness. I forgot to pray today. How many times have I said that to myself? You get up, you get busy, you get going, and you forget to pray, or you're in the midst of prayer and you forget what you need to pray for. That's easy. You just ask God for help. Still, it's a challenge to prayer. Laziness. Oh, there we go. Uh huh. Greg's going to start stomping on toes right now. Yes, my own included. Laziness is a challenge to prayer. It is easy. To just say, I'll, I'll do that tomorrow, or I'll do that later. And tomorrow and later never really comes, does it? Laziness is a challenge to prayer. Self-centeredness. How many times have my prayers been a recitation of the things that I need or want or that worry me most? Self-centeredness. Being focused on myself is a challenge to prayer. Distractions, distractions, 
distractions. It never fails that when I'm trying to pray at night just before going to bed, that's when Chase, my miniature pincher, or Calvin, my chihuahua, or Fanny, my basset hound, or all three together decide that it's time to play. Nothing worse than being kneeling at the edge of your bed and three dogs are fighting behind you. And they decide that your feet look tempting too. Distractions abound. Sometimes we're secretly happy when they crop up because praying can actually be hard work. Once at the monastery, the brothers were in a time of deep prayer. We were meditating in the chapel. We were sitting in the cloister across from each other in these benches that are designed to keep you just uncomfortable enough that you don't fall asleep. Kind of like these pews here. And we were sitting facing each other. We were in prayer. It was quiet. I was looking at the stained glass windows up above me. And those stained glass windows can sometimes be distracting, but usually they help me focus on either a passage of Scripture that they're describing or the, the acts of this particular saint or that particular person that are a devotion for us to follow. And we would pray. We were in the middle of prayer on one of those lengthy prayer times, and it was quiet. It was so quiet that you could hear the noise of traffic out on Memorial Drive. Once there was an accident, a crash. Two or more cars had a fender bender out there not too far from the front of the church. And the acrimonious argument between the two drivers came wafting down the nave towards where we were sitting in the chancel area. And most of us were saddened by the sounds that wafted over us. Though some of the language that was used caused some of us, like myself, to snicker. But when it became quiet again, it became so quiet, so still, so solemn, that you could hear your own heartbeat. And then you could hear the heart of your neighbor beating. It was an incredible, quiet time. Then, that night, we were back in the chapel yet again after dinner, quietly praying, and we were in the contemplation portion of the final prayers before going to bed. And it was quiet, quiet, quiet. There wasn't a single sound in the sanctuary. Somebody squirched a little bit on the pew. You could hear it. It sounded like a whole herd of elephants had come through the room. It was quiet, quiet, quiet. And then suddenly in the distance, we started to hear this. Meow. Meow. And of course, there's a bunch of cats outside doing what cats will do. But to me, I was hearing not only meow, meow, but Greg, is God talking to me in the voice of cats? There are always distractions, excuses, and alternatives to prayer. But we must find a way to get around those interruptions because prayer is essential. Prayer and persistence in prayer for our spiritual lives. Jesus said, Will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? That's a rhetorical question. The answer is, of course, no, he won't delay. I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. If an unjust judge will relent and grant justice to this persistent widow, this person who was one of the least powerful in her society, someone who was just barely above servants and slaves in status, someone who wouldn't have had any standing at all before the judge had her husband been alive or her father been alive or her son been alive or a nephew been alive, some other man 
If an unjust judge would grant her justice, how much more will God? We must be persistent in our prayers. Now that doesn't mean wearing out God's ears. That means, it may mean, it can very well mean wearing out our knees. Prayer is essential to everything the church does. We don't just pray before meals. We have prayer at the beginning of our worship services. Our songs and hymns are forms of prayer. Prayer and praise. Like the music of the third century, the Gloria Patri and the doxology. That's the praise music of the early church, friends. We sing that as a form of prayer. We have our praise music in modern times. We have our hymns that we sing. They're all forms of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer. We pray during worship. Prayers of the people and the pastoral prayer. We pray the Lord's Prayer, the pattern of prayer that Jesus gave to His disciples. I pray before I preach. And after I preach, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. We pray a confession of sin prior to communion. We pray during communion itself. That the, that's a long prayer that we pray, calling upon the Holy Spirit to consecrate the elements into the body and blood of Christ. We pray as we receive communion. We pray the benediction at the end of the service and the sending forth. We pray in weddings. We pray in funerals. We pray in Sunday school class. We pray before church meetings and after church meetings. Prayer is essential. And it is throughout the life of the church. Prayer is more than just begging God for goodies. It's being open to the real presence of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. It is a means of grace. The means of grace that empowers all the means of grace. Because through prayer, we are connected anew and afresh to God. I can remember as a child praying before bed. And now my brother, I love my brother. Now I know y'all don't believe this, but I love my brother. And when we were sharing a room together, he always had the bunk above mine and I was on the bottom bunk because one day when I was sleeping on the top bunk I decided in my dreams to take a dive off of the top bunk so they put me down below which meant that when I would be praying just before bed my brother would be hanging over the top of the bunk bed and bothering my hair as I tried to pray there's nothing worse than a kid trying to pray, his older brother being mean, bothering his hair, and you reach over, grab the pillow, and go wham to try to stop him. In prayer, my brother could be a distraction. One time I prayed, I don't remember this, but mom does. One time I prayed, oh God, make Chuck stop bothering me. And it was then that the rail on the top of the Bunk bed gave way, and Chuck went falling onto the floor himself. And I said, Amen. <laughs> Prayer is essential for our life as Christians, as believers, as children of God, as followers of Jesus Christ. Prayer is essential in every aspect of our living. I believe in prayer, not just because my brother went tumbling down. I believe in prayer because prayer has changed my life. C.S. Lewis, his wife was dying of cancer. And he prayed for her and prayed for her and prayed for her. And when her cancer went into remission, the dean there at Cambridge University said to him, she has gotten better. God has listened to all of your prayers and she has gotten better. And C.S. Lewis said, I don't pray to change God's mind. I pray to change my own. Prayer has changed me. Prayer has changed me for the better. From a little child to an adult. 
Prayer has changed me. Prayer will change us all. I want to dedicate you. I want to challenge you. I want to encourage you to pray. If you find that the only time you pray are those rote automatic prayers or at church, I want to encourage you to set aside one time a day. And if you already pray, good. Set aside another time of day to pray. Doesn't have to be fancy. Doesn't have to be formal. Can be very simple. Oh God, get me through this day. I don't know what you may be facing. Sometimes it's health. Sometimes it's a lack of money in your bank account. Sometimes it's those people you have to see at work day after day. When I go to a district meeting, I say, God, get me through this meeting without saying something I'll regret. That can be your prayer too. I want to encourage you to set aside a time to pray. It can be simple. It can be direct. But spend as much time in prayer listening for God as you do speaking. In other words, ask for what you need and then listen for what God will say to you. Either in the things around you or on the radio or TV or the voice of someone near to you. Listen to what God may be saying to you. I want to challenge you to pray. Add an extra prayer time. I, I don't care if you pray morning, noon, and night, and every half hour in between. Find an extra time to say an extra prayer for your neighbor, for your loved one, for our nation, for this church, for me, for them, for you. Find a time to pray. Add just an extra few minutes to pray. Because prayer is essential. Persistent prayer is necessary. And God is listening. Will you listen to God? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And may God's people say, Amen. In your